Today I'm going to talk about Twitter's feature store. Uh, this talk has two parts. First, I'll go over the motivation for building the feature store. Then I'll go over the architectural components. So if we look back at the history of machine learning at Twitter, uh, it has spread relatively slowly throughout the organization with different teams coming on board and forming at different times. Although a, a lot of these teams have done a good job at sharing infrastructure for training models, each team has ended up in investing in their own feature engineering, which has resulted in limited sharing across the teams. So this has resulted in a feature disparity with well-established teams having a pretty clear advantage. Um, even though there's some sharing that has historically happened, typically it's been done in an ad hoc fashion or is isolated to a small number of teams. So when a new team decided to introduce machine learning into their product at Twitter, they either cloned an existing system or started from scratch, which is pretty limiting in terms of how well their model can perform. So on the feature store team, our main idea was that we didn't think it had to be this way. So this led us to the idea for the feature store, which aims to level the play playing field by making all features available to everyone with minimal effort, thus benefiting every team, even the well-established teams that already have a rich set of features. This means that new teams can start off at the same level as existing teams and not at the ground floor. And all teams can benefit when features are added or improvements are made to existing features. Okay, so I'd like to see a show of hands. Um, who thinks that the feature store is a service? Who thinks it's a storage system? Right, and who thinks that it's a library? Cool, okay, so it is actually a library. Um, and the goal of this library is to provide ways to hydrate feature data for logging and prediction, um, prepare feature data for offline training, and allow users to add features to a common catalog. Okay, so next we'll talk about the architecture of the feature store. Um, and this. This diagram shows an overview of the feature store arch architecture. Uh, we'll take a closer look at each section individually. Um, so first I'd like to talk about the catalog, which is really the backbone of the feature store. Um, the feature catalog is really what enables sharing features within the feature store. It contains all the information needed to access features which makes it really easy to use any feature that is registered um, and regardless of who created it, maintains it, or where it comes from. So defining a feature within the feature store automatically registers it with the catalog. Uh, this makes it, like I said, easy for other teams to use. Um, and this is something within our team that we've actually put a lot of, a lot of effort into. Uh, we try to make it as easy as possible for teams to register the features and data sets that they're coming from uh, so that what may have previously taken 100 lines of code now can be expressed in just a few dozen. So here's an example of registering a data set. Uh, registering a data set involves specifying modes of online and offline access. Uh, this is done via providing an online path um, that basically says where this data is coming from in an online manner. Um, and then we also have users define what we call a typed pipe, which is used for offline access. Um, and we'll take a closer look at these methods of access a bit later. But for now, the important part is that this enables us to hide from users where and how the data is being fetched. So this code snippet shows an example of registered features um, features are extracted from a data set. The features shown here are actually extracted from the previous data set, uh, from the previous data set that I showed on the other slide. So you can see that uh, this says PewDiePie entity data set. And going back to the last slide, that is what that data set is called. Um, 
So in addition to this data that describes how to access the data, um, we require users to add a description, which in turn is displayed on an accompanying UI. Uh, so here's a screenshot of the UI. Um, we call this ML Dash or ML Dashboard. It's something that one of our sister teams works on. So for each feature, the UI shows the name, uh, which is generated automatically when a feature is registered. Um, and then it also displays the description, uh, which is the part that we require from users and some other additional metadata, like whether or not the data set is, or the feature is available online or offline or both. Um, so once features are registered, how can they actually be used and accessed in code? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, access is provided in two different ways. Um, so first we'll talk about offline access. Circled here are components of the feature usage, uh, of the offline components of feature usage. And taking a closer look, we see that features that sit in offline data sets are joined offline using our offline job library, which we call feature storage, join, feature storage joiner. Uh, and this operates on top of Hadoop. There are two main functionalities we provide. Um, the first is joining features and or label data and also generating training data. This code snippet shows an example of joining in features and label data to an offline data source. Uh, the features are joined in by using join features and labels are joined in by using join labels. Um, the library automatically determines how to do the join efficiently. Um, at Twitter, offline features are almost always stored on our HDFS cl cluster, and as such, our feature store joiner API is designed to work with Scalding, which is the Scala DSL for cascading, the primary for work framework for that we use at Twitter to write Hadoop jobs. Um, this API takes an option, optional and required set of features. Uh, this basically means that any data that does not contain values for all features in the required set will be filtered out. So moving on to online access uh, and taking a look back at our diagram, these are the main components of the online architecture. So zooming in a bit, we see that the online flow starts with a request from an end user for features. As an example, this could be a request from our timelines team, which de determines what order to display tweets on, uh, tweets on your feed when you go to twitter.com. Um, so this request is sent to what we call the feature store client, which is an RPC client we provide for fetching online feature data. And the feature store client is built on top of Strato, um, another Twitter internal tool that we use to actually fetch the data. So this code snippet shows an example of how the feature store client is used. Uh, first, you set up the features you want to fetch, um, and here we've set up tweet features and some user features. Uh, next, you set up the client, uh, and you do that by basically just passing the features you want to fetch to the client. Then you create a feature store request, uh, which basically is a container for the IDs you want to fetch features for. In this case, uh, we've passed in a user ID and tweet ID for both the user features and the tweet features. And finally, the request is passed to the client. Uh, note that the client returns something called a prediction rec record which contains the fetch fe feature data and maintains the relationship between uh, the fact that these features are tweet features and these other features are user features. So let's take a closer look at Strato. Um, Strato really provides a lot for us at the feature store. It provides a way to serve data and apply the sim simple business logic to that data. Uh, for our purpose, in the feature store, Strato makes it possible to hide almost all the complexity of fetching data behind a consistent API with a very small amount of overhead. Um, as an example, 
let's say we had a data set that is generated daily in batch using Hadoop and then written to HDFS. Uh, a data set like that could be easily updated to one that is updated in real time without the clients who are already fetching that data having to change at all. Um, so here's an example that illustrates how to set up something that fetches data from Stratum or through Stratum. Um, this particular example is for fetching data from Manhattan, a key value store used at Twitter. And basically all you do is you provide the path to the database, the name of the data set, and the type of the key and value. And this allows you to fetch data through Strato. Um, you could easily change this into something that is a service, like a thrift service or something like that, without the client ever knowing the difference. Um, so just to reiterate and summarize, the goals of the feature store are to encourage the sharing of features across teams, um, provide declarative and easy to use libraries, and these two things combined uh, allow us to provide a marketplace, not a database. Oh. Um, so I think we have time for questions. Anyone has any? How do you manage if it's a centralized feature store? Um, if updates are made to specific features, does that impact consumers? If there, if there are multiple models consuming that feature, would it affect? Yes, it does. Or I mean, yeah, most likely. It kind of depends on how they updated it, right? But so that is something that we will probably work on more try to find an automated way in the future. Um, right now, what we do is uh, essentially our team kind of is a gatekeeper for code, code reviews like that. And we either make sure that the appropriate teams have been notified or that it's deprecated in some way, the previous version of the feature. Um, I think, well, some of that comes down to how the Twitter architecture is, uh, which is we ha have a mono repo, um, so it's really easy for us to do something like that. Uh, also, we didn't really want to own any services. It's easier for our team that way to maintain things uh, and like less on call rotations, things like that. How, how data scientists use your feature store? Like most of them know like only Python, but maybe you don't hire these guys. And if I want to add a feature to uh, your library, uh, and uh, imagine I'm a data scientist, like how does it work? They create a Jira for you or they can add it? Um, so we, historically, like we're a newer team. We have uh, worked really close with some teams especially larger teams that have a lot of features to migrate them to the feature store and have actually done that for them. Uh, we're moving more towards uh, education at Twitter and how to do it themselves. But at your point about data scientists mostly knowing Python is correct, but at Twitter we mostly use Scala. So it's kind of something that data scientists are forced to use, really. I think like also, <laughs> Also, um, at Twitter, the way things work is it tends to be ML infra teams that are like adding the features to be fetched in production. Um, and so like while a data scientist might work on figuring out what a good feature might be, the ML infra team is the one that sets, us up, sets it up to be used. Yep. Yeah, so it is really, um, most features are fetched directly from like a service, for service or a database um, or like a cache. And then there might be some extraction on top of that. 
And we, whenever a feature is registered, you're basically defining what that extraction sh should be. So you're, they're, they're providing a function for us to execute later. Is that, is that helpful? Yeah. Feature is stored on like a key value basis. There's always one value and then the ID is surfaced in that. Yes, line. yes, that's accurate. So we found like after kind of observing and talking to different customers that features generally, and this is not, this fits like 99% of our use cases, that they have, they're associated with some sort of entity, like uh, the nouns of Twitter, like a user, a tweet, um, an ad, tweet thing, something like that. Uh, and so we've, after seeing that pattern, you see that like most of the ways that features are provided are keyed by one of those. So, so like they're associated with a single user, a single tweet, et cetera. There are some cases where you have like edge features, so like a user tweet feature, or like user user features. So the data scientists would, their data preparation essentially would be a bunch of joining of all the features they want to build their data set for their model. Does that end up being their workflow? Ye yeah, I, so there haven't been too many new teams um, since I've been on the team at least that have like freshly started a model. Um, it's mostly existing models and like adding, uh, at incrementally adding features for like very small gains. Um, and so basically everything so far has been set up and already in place and they're just swapping out their current architecture, that, their current code that like goes and fetches directly from a Manhattan data set or like some sort of database and then a thrift service for using the feature store, which abstracts all the way, all that away for, for them. Yep. How do you handle like the edge type features? Like if you have like a user, 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 do you store it like with both keys as like a different kind of entity or? We do, yeah. We, well, it's really under the hood represented by, it's like a two, like a two tuple. Um, if you're familiar with that. Uh, uh, that part of Scala is really helpful for us. Um, and like most IDs are simple things like strings or longs, integers. I guess longs probably, mostly. Yep. I'm uh, wondering, so in terms of feature, right, you also need to handle a feature for unstructured data, like image uh, or video. Um, user treat. So your question is how are we handling image or video data? Uh, yeah, I mean for this feature store things, uh, so in, yeah, the feature is, is, the, is the feature for text data only or actually it's, a, it's more like a, a feature that no matter how your user uh, share on Twitter and you, uh, you guys just trying to fill all so the um, this kind of high level feature together to provide a general feature for all of your teams. Since the, the content of uh, treat, uh, the user can treat is quite, can be quite diverse, right? Um, so, I think like I still kind of don't understand what your question is. <laughs> Sorry. All right, any other questions? Thank you, Brittany, appreciate your time.